Welcome to the series Writing for Games. In this video, I'm going to cover quest planning as we think about quests as we're doing across a number of videos now. So let's review what this other video has discussed. First, quests impose structure, provide variety, and suggest meaningful actions to players. We've covered in a previous video how quests provide tasks for people to do. We collect things, kill things, escort things, and they provide variety, different kinds of play a player might want to take on when choosing what quest to do. They also suggest meaningful actions. A player can choose if they want to support one faction over another or get a potential reward from one quest versus another quest. And this allows them to make meaningful choices and suggest meaningful actions within the corresponding structures provided by the quests. When we talk about quests, we divide them into two different categories. Main quest, sometimes called a main campaign or a main scenario, that propels the central plot and establishes story-driven checkpoints, and a second category of things, side quests. When we talk about side quests, we often think about them as being clustered, that is, thematic or spatially arranged, or as ongoing occasional completion quests. To talk about these more generally, let's think about them in the matter of planning. To help us with that, let's examine two different examples of how quests are presented within the games, and then we'll talk about how more generally quests can be planned. So as an example, let's look at Horizon Forbidden West from 2022. In this game, quests are divided into lots of different categories of things you can do, again providing variety. Anytime the main quest is progressed, the corresponding or primary story is also progressed. The player also has the ability to engage in a variety of different things and make meaningful choices that is suggest meaningful actions that players might want to undertake. They can do errands, side quests, jobs, salvage contracts, hunting grounds, melee pit, the arena, rebel camps, and rebel outposts. So a larger variety of play all within quest structures, here's the next step, here's the next step, and here's the next step, and also allowing a player to make meaningful actions, make meaningful choices, among the type of play they might want to undertake. They might want to be more combat-oriented, or they might want to be more salvage or exploration-oriented, and a player can choose in any given session what they want to do. So, quest providing structure, variety, and suggesting meaningful actions. Let's look at a different example. If we look at Diablo 4, we see that quests are divided into two main categories of things. We have the campaign, which is the main quest, and we have the side quests. Then within the side quest category of things, we also see them regionally organized, that is, spatially organized. And so within Diablo 4, when we think about these, we see campaign and a side quest. So let's talk a little bit about quest planning based on those two different examples we just saw. Planning, we generally think about the three categories of time, space, and friction. And this will help us more generally plan quests we might want to make by looking at examples in other games. So let's start with time, and then we'll move through space, and then finally talk about friction, and then sum this all up. So when we talk about quest planning as it applies to time, we often think about the main quest versus side quest and how long they take to do. So as we're designing games, or even just critiquing existing games, we're thinking about time within this category. How long do these things take to do? Is someone collecting 5 things, 10 things, 15 things, 20 things? How long do those tasks take to do within the game? Correspondingly, when we're thinking about side quest versus main quest, how much time does one thing take, the main quest as a whole unit, versus how much time do individual side quests and then all of the side quests take to complete? One of the ways to help us think about this is looking at existing data. There's a really great resource called How Long to Beat that reports on both the kind of main story or main quest and main story plus side quests or side activities. So if we were to look at the example of Elden Ring, we would see that the reported data shows that most people take about 60 hours, 59 hours, to complete the main story within Elden Ring. If you're completing the main story plus all the kind of side activities or side story, the side quests, it's generally about 100 hours. 
So this gives us a pretty good breakdown that if you're doing everything, it will take you roughly 60% of the time to do the main story or main quest, and roughly 40% of the time, or 40 hours in the 100 hour example here, to do the side quests. Let's look at a different example. If we were to look at Baldur's Gate 3, we see actually a pretty common breakdown. The main story is roughly 60 hours, about 64 from repeated from reported data, and the main or side quest is about 100 or about 108 hours right here. So we see a pretty similar breakdown that we just saw in a different game. That the main story is roughly 60%, and the side content or side activities is roughly 40 to 50%. Put more generally, the side quests add 40 to 50% extra time to completion for most games. So as you're creating your own games or looking at existing games, start to do this math. How long does the main quest, main campaign, main scenario take? How much time do activities or side quests or whatever else is in the game take to complete? Put all together, that might be the total time for completion. 10 hours, 12 hours, 50 hours, 100 hours. And then start to subdivide that. How long do quests take? How many quests do I need? Do I need a main quest plus five side quests? Or do I need 50 side quests? How much time am I investing or asking players to invest as I'm designing this game? So as we're thinking about time, let's think about an overlapping category of space. So when we talk about space in quest planning, we're generally interested in kind of two questions. First, where did the quest take place? Are they taking place in the same area that the starting quest is in? Do they take place in other areas? Do the characters need to travel far distances? How long or where do the quests take place? And of course, time is an aspect of this. How or where do quests overlap thematically or spatially? So if we're looking at a quest or a side quest within Diablo 4, we might have multiple quests in the same area. They might have us kill a certain number of enemies, and they might also have us collect things that those enemies drop. And so spatially, those two quests overlap with each other, and we could potentially complete them at the same time. We also see quests often overlap, especially in games like Diablo and Baldur's Quest, thematically. There might be quests that have the same general starting point in a town or village that are asking you to do the same things. Go clear this area of monsters, or go clear this area of monsters and clear a blockage or something else. In which case, thematically, they're helping to save a town. Spatially, they're overlapping potentially in the same area. So these two are not exclusive, but there are ways to think about this. Is there a theme or is there a special relationship between these side quests? And it can also help us drive play in particular areas as we're thinking about space. For that, let's kind of shift our thinking a little bit. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt from 2015 has many quests beginning in towns and cities. In fact, if we map the starting point for many quests, we will see that they often start at more urban areas and shift into more rural or forested areas. And this is actually a very, very common pattern. So it's called the spoke hub model in which the hub serves as a town or a village or inn and then spokes, that is, they're leaving, and then circling back to the hub again. So we often find this, generally, in many, many games that have multiple quests. In fact, Diablo 4 also has this model, so does Baldur's Gate 3, so does The Witcher 3, and many, many other games. And so as we talk about this, we commonly find this model. And in fact, it's so common, you've probably experienced it outside of games as well. If you've ever been to an airport or a bus port or a train station, you've experienced the spoke hub model, where you're at a particular hub and then you're leaving and oftentimes returning back again. Easy to design spaces in this way because we're used to seeing this model. So we design spaces that have merchants or quest starting points in cities or towns or other things like that. Then players with their characters adventure out and then return back again. In fact, we often find this in first-person shooter design as well, where there will be starting areas or starting hubs with merchants or upgrading spaces in which the characters will adventure out and then return back again. Let's finally end this by talking about friction. So often when we're talking about game design, people want to use the word fun or enjoyment as kind of qualifiers to things. Is this fun to do? Do people find enjoyment out of it? 
that's not really useful as design terms. And the reason why is it's very hard to quantify fun in a kind of more objective way. We can talk about it in relative ways. One person finds one thing fun and another person does not find that thing fun. But it's not really useful when we're talking about design unless we're designing for a very, very specific audience. We're talking about more generalized audiences. It becomes very difficult to quantify this. How much enjoyment? How much fun? What does this mean to other people? Instead of thinking about enjoyment or pleasure, let's think a little bit about impediment or obstacles. So put another way, let's talk about friction. So when we're talking about design terms, especially quest planning, we will often use intentional design to put friction in the place of players to help guide them about what to do next and potential things to not do. So when we talk about friction in design, this is intentional design to slow down or try to prevent errors by introducing obstacles. Chances are you've probably seen this in interface design where many websites and operating systems and other things will actually ask you multiple times before you want to delete something. So it is intentionally introducing friction to avoid you accidentally deleting something or accidentally removing something. You may see an option like, are you sure? Are you really sure? When we talk about it in quest planning, we often see games that have level areas where enemies, activities, and quests match a certain range. And this is very, very common in MMORPG design and especially more open world design, where certain areas will have certain levels associated with them. And in fact, Diablo 4 also uses this as another example, where certain areas in the game are designed for certain level actions. So this means being under that level range makes things harder and takes longer. So if we're thinking about time and we're thinking about space, those are equal concerns to the frictive design within a particular spatial awareness or spatial design of particular quests. So we want people to be doing certain quests in certain areas, and we introduce greater friction if they try to not do that. At the same time, level areas are often paired with something called gates. And we see this very commonly in more general game design. That is, many games like Hollow Knight and other Metroidvania games contain gates, sometimes literal physical gates, but oftentimes more movement-limited gates, to limit exploration until certain goals are met. And these will verify to us as designers that players have achieved certain goals. They have defeated certain bosses or collected certain items, and then we allow them to move to the next part of the game, or we allow a greater exploration expression. In many games, like Metroidvania games, things like Symphony of the Night or the Metroid series, we often collect certain powers or certain abilities that then allow greater movement. We can now double jump, or we can now jump higher, or we can now swim in water, or we can now move faster. And these allow greater exploration options. Now, it is often possible to skip these gates. You often find this as part of speedruns, but they generally require glitches, complex movement combination, uh, combinations, and other tricks. Some players will want to do that, and we allow them to do it. And so in many cases, introducing friction instead of introducing physical gates where you have to do something can be a better design. We want players to be sure that they are making intentional choices, but we don't necessarily stop them from doing things they may not want to do. So we check them, hey, this next area has higher level enemies. Are you sure you want to do it? And perhaps they do, in which case we allow them to do it. Rather than setting kind of firm gates, now you have to go collect these keys, you have to complete these bosses. There are reasons why one approach might be better than the other, but both of us allow us to talk about friction within quest design. So let me summarize what I've talked about across this video. We're talking about quest planning, we often draw from general game design terms. So we see things like time, space, and friction being major concerns within our quest design. Remember, of course, that quests are imposing structure. They are suggesting tasks to complete to achieve certain goals, the reward for that quest. So what are we asking them to do? Are they collecting things? Are they escorting things? Are they eliminating certain things? What are they doing? How long does that take as we think about time concerns? At the same time, where is that going on? And do potential quests overlap with each other either thematically, maybe we're defeating vampires and also collecting the things they drop, in like a Diablo 4 example. So is there a way to think about thematic and spatial overlapping within these quests? At the same time, what friction are we introducing to help guide player actions. 
So we might say, hey, if you're at this particular level, this is a great area for you to enjoy. If you're at another particular level range, this is a different area for you to enjoy. And help guide that player experience by inducing intentional obstacles. Here are gates that prevent you from doing that until you've achieved other things. So between all three of these, we can help plan out how we want certain things to happen within quests. Again, thinking of main quests propelling the central or primary story and side quests as either clustered or ongoing. So through all of these, we can help plan out what quests we want to do and help guide players through our story experience by thinking about time, place, and friction as part of quest planning. Thanks for watching.